Good afternoon, and welcome to another installment of our ongoing nonprofit leadership and engagement education series. I am Joanne Naser, Manager of Nonprofit Leadership and Engagement at the Washington County Community Foundation. Thank you for joining us today to learn from our content experts on developing donor recognition societies. Our presenters' bios and photos are on the WCCF website. So I'm pleased to introduce to you now Tracy Libertor. She's the executive director of the Bradford House Historical Association. Tracy, thank you. Thank you so much. So um, let me share my screen to start. Hey. Um, I have a short um, PowerPoint that we'll go through. As Joanne said, my name is Tracy Libertor. For those of you who do not know me, I am the executive director at the Bradford House Historical Association. We actually have three locations on South Main Street, the Bradford House Museum, the Whiskey Rebellion Education Visitor Center, and the Meeting House. We have lots of events that happen throughout the year, but our largest event is the Whiskey Rebellion Festival. Prior to coming to the Bradford House and working in the nonprofit field, I worked for a corporation, National City Bank, if some of you remember, for 18 years, I was a project manager. So I brought the business side to the Bradford House. Um, that being said, my focus at the Bradford House is on operations and looking to improve operations. So about five years ago, we started to take a serious look at the Bradford House. Uh, we created a development plan. Um, part of the development plan allowed us to create committees. A strategic plan was created and we started work on um, museum accreditation. We are working with the American Alliance of Museum. Um, just giving you this background to let you know why we're diving into development. So, and for those of you who don't know, uh, museum accreditation is just about a five year process. Um, we've completed three of the years. Um, it's a great process because it shows us, you know, basically what we do good and what we need to improve on. So why should we focus on development? Um, at the Bradford House, we do not receive any regular state or local government funding. Um, a majority of what I do is write grants, but the grants are specific to purpose and programs and not for operations. Um, as I mentioned, the three locations, uh, we expanded our campus two times in the last three years. So the uh, visitor center and the meeting house were just opened, which resulted in increased costs. We actually pay rent for those two um, additions. And another reason for development is inflation. I mean, we're all realizing that everything costs more money now. So um, I mentioned the, the committees and the reason I mentioned that we formed committees is um, to lead into development. We do have a development committee. Um, all of our committees have board members and community members on them, um, and we meet once a month. So the committee gets together and then we report back to the board on um, what we're working on, what we need to work on, and you know what help we need from the board. Um, our, one thing that you should know about our committees, um, as I said, they're community members and board members, so on our development committee, we actually have no, um, how can I say it's no people educated on development. You know, we attend free training sessions such as the ones that WCCF puts on. We've used an outside consultant. We look to experts in the field. We evaluate, you know, what we've done in the past, what works and what doesn't. And we basically look to the success of other places to give us ideas of what to do moving forward. So the development committee looked at WCCF and saw how successful they were with their giving society. So we decided to give it a try. I'm sure many of you on the, um, on the Zoom are saying to yourself, you know, we like to do what WCCF does. They're very successful, so why not give it a try? So we created the Whiskey Rebellion Society. 
this was a slow process. And the reason I say that is, so the, the development committee decided we were going to do this and then it needed board approval. And then we were going to, you know, what do you name the levels and what amount should the levels be? You know, what documents should be created? What talking points should be created? It, it's not something that if you're sitting here watching this and you go, oh, I should do a, um, a donor society. It's absolutely not something that happens overnight. Um, and that's the point of this slide. So this is just to show you, um, we do have the information on our website, but the, the determining the levels of giving are important. So our lowest level of giving is $1,000 and our highest level of giving is 40,000. It's not to say that we wouldn't take more money than that, but the other thing was the naming, you know, so what name should you use? You should use something that the, what we found we wanted to do was use something close to um, our hearts. We are, we represent David Bradford, who was a leader in the Whiskey Rebellion. So all of our different names of our levels are all related to us specifically. So, so we decided we were going to have a society. Then we created the names and the um, amounts. So then what do we do next? So the most important part is this step. Who do you ask to become a society member? So we started with our board. And the reason we started with our board was simple. Um, everyone who is part of WCCF Gives knows that how important it is to get your board involved. I mean, uh, WCCF Gives was running a contest that if every board member was involved, then you had a chance of, of earning some extra money. So it's important for many reasons to have every board member involved. Um, also, you know, when you go to someone and you say, do you want to be a society member? It's nice to say 100% of our board is on is doing this, you know, so it gives them a sense of it's very important and everyone agrees with it. So first thing we did was we asked all of our board members to be a member and, a, and they did. So then after each board member became a member, we asked each board member to give us names of families and friends. So then our, our first ask was our board members. Our second ask was family and friends of our board members. So we, so those were the first two steps of, I'm still talking about the who, who do you ask to be part of your society? Well, the next thing we did was we have had donors over the past. Um, and um, like many of you, we have a CRM system. Um, I use Little Green Light. It's great for our small organization. And we looked at donors in Little Green Light and decided that we would reach out to them. So we've asked our board, we've asked family and friends, and now we're asking people who have been donors in the past to be part of society. So we had a very successful start. 15 board members joined. So that's all of our board members. We had 16 community members that joined. So to date, we've raised or have committed to nearly $80,000. Um, this is a wonderful start in our, in our mind. Um, the, the way our pledges work is we allow it over five years. So if you're a thousand dollar donor, you can give $200 for the next five years. So that was, that was our start. I'm sorry, I'm going so fast. I know that Sarah has tons to talk about too. So, um, I have my contact information at the end. If you have questions, I can talk to you personally and explain some more. Um, so I, I like to always talk about successes and failures, or maybe not even a failure, misses, you know, hits and misses. So I talked about our success. We, you know, we raised nearly $80,000. The part, the miss for us was um, we had decided the way we would contact those little green light, those donors was to send a mailer. So we sent, um, I sent out, I did a mailer, 175 letters and flyers to the our donors who have given in the past. Of that 175 mailings, only one person replied. So this just proved that mailers are not successful. Um, 
as we know, it's very important when you're doing development and working with donors, you know, mailers don't work, relationships do. Um, so we lost the money on this mailer. So what have we learned um, about the giving societies? And, and keep in mind, when, when I say that um, the steps that we're in, we're we're very new to societies. This has all happened within the last year that we have decided we want to be offer societies that we've contacted people. So um, it's very new to me. Sarah will talk about, she has great experience in the societies and has done it a lot longer, but we thought it would be fun to show you two sides of it because I'm sure there are some on the Zoom that have never done this before. So what we learned by going through the society developing giving societies are they're a great way to raise operational funds. You know, as I mentioned before, I do a lot of grants, um, but we all know that most grants are not for operation operations. So um, the other thing we learned is time must be spent building relationships. Um, you know, that's why I said about development, sending a mailer is not the way to go on these giving societies. The third thing is, this is not a job for one person or one committee. Um, I mention this because we, there are so many people out there who could be giving to us or could be giving to you, and one person cannot get this done. Um, our committee, we have a committee of five people. The the best way that the this society can work is getting your entire board engaged. Um, we feel at the Bradford House, we feel very strongly about that. In fact, on Saturday, uh, I just held our second board retreat, and the topic was board development and explaining to um, the, the entire Bradford House board how important it is to for everyone to be involved in, um, I hate to use the word fundraising, but in raising funds for the Bradford House, the the everyone has to be involved. Everyone's committed for us to get more money. Um, so a lot of people um, don't like asking. We've learned that also. Um, a lot of our board members are shy to ask people. Um, sharing names, you know, say, say Tony doesn't like to call someone or enter, but they could tell me about Tony and I could reach out to them. So so as I said just a couple of minutes ago, we are just getting started and learning through this process. I wanted to make sure that I spoke to you and, and talked about the steps that we have done and um, let you know that it, it can be done. If you're sitting there thinking, should I do a giving society? It's worth giving it a chance. Um, so what are, what are we, the Bradford House, missing regarding uh, societies? Uh, board engagement, uh, having everyone involved in the campaign. The other thing is donor recognition. Um, at WCCF, they have those beautiful leaves that have people's names on it. We're kind of in a tough spot because the I mentioned our three sites. Um, the meeting house doesn't have a lot of traffic. So you'd hate to put donors' names in there because they wouldn't see it very often. The visitor center has its own donor wall because I raised money for it. And the Bradford House Museum is a National Historic Landmark. So we're kind of um, still trying to figure out the best way to recognize our donors. Uh, we do have a really nice flyer, uh, a donor, the Donor Society flyer that names everyone who is a donor already on it. And we update that regularly. But as far as having a, a plaque on a wall or having a sign somewhere, we just haven't done that yet. And we we recognize, we had a development committee yesterday um, meeting and we recognize that that is a miss and work, we're working on rectifying that. The other thing is a firm timeline, something that we're missing. Uh, the, I mentioned that the, the development committee gets together once a month, but we need to um, keep on, keep working the campaign. I would hate to come back to you in six months and say, well, we're in the exact same position we were when I talked to you six months ago. 
this is something that has to be consistently worked on. So our next steps regarding a, a society is, um, as I mentioned, the board meeting, we had that this last Saturday. We need to start spending more time developing relationships. Testimonials are a great thing. We have asked um, some board members and some volunteers and community members to draft test or to draft a testimonial for us. We actually have a wonderful board member who is going to proof them and put some finishing touches on them. Um, and then the last thing, um, as far as our next steps is, we have started to have joint meetings between the development committee and our marketing committee. Um, the marketing committee and the development committee need to work with each other, meaning that, you know, signs and stuff, things, ways to promote development committee, the marketing committee can help with. So as I said, I, I, I spurted out a lot of information in a very quick time, um, but um, once Sarah does her presentations, if you have any questions for me, and we're going to be sharing our slides with everyone when the presentation is over, um, feel free to call my cell phone or contact me at in, info at bradfordhouse.org. Um, it's something very easy for me to talk about, even though we just got started, um, and I'd love some feedback or even if you have suggestions for us. Thank you so much, Tracy. It was a lot of great information from um, just the beginning. And if you could just, you said it's been about a year. Do you have uh, more of any specific dates or any more type of a timeline? Like when did the board approve or something like that? Um. So yes, yeah, so it the, the, the easiest timeline for me is the last time when we did that mailer. So that was our last step was in November. And we mm -hmm. haven't done anything since then, except for talk about it. That's why I keep saying a timeline is so important because it can get lost in the, oh, it's a holiday or it's this or it's that. Right. Giving needs to march on every day. Great. <laughs> yeah. So thanks again for the information. And uh, next Next speaking will be Sarah Schumacher. She's the executive director of the Washington Health System Foundation. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Are you able to see my screen there? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Tracy, so much for sharing. You gave us a lot of valuable information. And honestly, what you shared makes me think you've been doing uh, this great work with focusing on membership societies for longer than a year. So when you create something, it becomes very close to you. So you can tell you're passionate. Um, and I picked up a couple of things from you as well. So um, just to introduce myself, I have been in development and this fundraising world for 22 years. I started here at the Washington Health System right out of college, which is a little bit unique to start a profession in philanthropy and fundraising so young, but sort of found my passion there and then went to Mon Valley Hospital, which is now part of the Penn Highlands Health System. And I came back to the Washington Health System six years ago to replace Rich Mahoney, who many of you probably know and in Deer, and I'm the executive director. And so I'm going to talk a little bit today about forming a gift society or a club or whatever you want to name it. And I'm going to talk about sort of um, how you get started, questions to ask, and then a little bit about our society. And then um, as Tracy has done, I actually started a giving society at Mon Valley Hospital. So I've had the pleasure of coming into one and then also uh, creating one from the beginning. Uh, so Oh, and now my slide is not working. Ah, uh, So I am a student of Stephen Covey, and I always like to begin with the end in mind. And you'll see as this presentation goes through how important that is when we talk about, um, and Tracy touched upon this, sort of the why, why are you creating this society? I think the most important thing is to think about it like a strategic plan, right? What's your mission, your vision, and, and how do you want that to look in the end? And we'll talk a little bit about, um, Tracy, you talked about uh, failing, and I'm going to call it failing forward. I wrote that down because I know someone wiser than me has taught me that when we fail, we really are moving forward to make adjustments. So um, it's always great to look at what was successful, 
but also what are the things that we can do to be better. So for Tracy, she talked a little bit about operations and sort of that's their why and their goal. And so the giving clubs that I have created have been more for filling in the gaps, equipment, program. And so I only share this with you because I think it's important to know really why you're creating the society. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. So I talked about looking at it like a strategic plan, and we always start with, of course, we know the mission of our organization, which is overarching, but then what's the vision? What do we want this club really to look like in the end? And who's the target audience? It might seem really obvious. There's been many times where people have asked me and I've just said, well, everyone is the target, right? Because couldn't everyone be a donor of the Washington Health System Foundation? And the truth is you almost need to find really that client profile or donor profile, depending on the levels of giving that you're trying to attract, which we'll talk a little bit more about. And then what is your goal? So, of course, it's fundraising, but to Tracy's point that she emphasized, and you'll hear me emphasize, it's really about fundraising. The more relationships you have, I have found that the fundraising piece of it is actually the easy part. It's educating, it's bringing people along, it's getting them to really not just believe in your program, but to buy into the mission that, you know, we're really selling to them. And then who in the community can help? So um, like Tracy, that is really key in everything that we do. We go to the best supporters, the people who are closest to the organization, and we ask for their help. And so with, with each of the societies I've been involved with, the key component has been that groundwork of people who have created a committee and who continue to stay with us and help us refine and um, determine where we're headed next. So if you know me, I ask a lot of questions. I'm extremely inquisitive. And that leads me into the next slide, which has a lot of questions on it. If you think about my first slide that said begin with the end in mind, these are a lot of the things that I strongly recommend before jumping into building your society that you have answers to all these questions. So what is the club's brand. It almost has a life of its own. I know our society does, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that at the end of my presentation, but it has a logo, it has a feel, and we almost use it. It's like having an event. So 1897, we want people to see it. We want, as soon as you see that, we want them to know that's WHS Foundation and that's something that's special. Uh, what donors do you currently have who will jump on board and help early and help lead the initiative with you? It's sort of like whenever you go to a live auction and you are running the event and you plant a seed in the audience, right? You need somebody to start bidding and you want them, you know, you need somebody to raise the paddle first. And this is no different. You need people who are willing to raise their hand and say, I'm going to be a member of this. And you need to make that first group of donors feel extremely special. What is your criteria for giving? I will tell you that uh, this is something that we're dealing with right now. So our society started uh, some time ago. And as all things, the world is changing around us. Donors are changing the feel for nonprofits and which ones they want to be engaged with is changing. And so we're changing how you become a member of 1897. So I am a big proponent of looking at things down the line, but you cannot see or foresee everything. I wish I had that magic eight ball to tell me. But what we have found is that we need to be creative with the criteria of how people come into the society. And I think being nimble and being really willing to look at that and make that judgment call is extremely important as we're moving forward. You need to think about, is this a one-year commitment, a three-year commitment, a five-year commitment? Um, again, we'll talk a little bit about levels and, and Tracy shared hers with you. Um, does, does, it, does it count if you are going to sponsor an event? So for instance, um, Sarah Schumacher commits to $1,000. Now the organization has to decide, is that something that goes toward her giving society amount? 
or is giving society giving completely separate? And I will tell you, this has been a huge, huge topic of conversation for us and has become extremely important. Um, and then Tracy also touched a little bit about sort of what are the, the benefits of being a member and then a little bit about recognition. And so, you know, we often find that people don't give necessarily to receive something back. But if you pro can provide a benefit that's meaningful and you can provide recognition that they want, it continues to build that relationship that we're talking about. So, you know, I don't know if that's free parking, entry into an event, a discount on a ticket. For us, it means many things. We hold special events and have um, special communication for those members. And we do that so that they feel like they're part of our family. And I'll show you some photos from that as we get a little bit further down the line. Um, why would someone want to be a member of your society or your group. I'm a member of ours and I take it very seriously being the executive director. I could attend those events if I want to, right? We plan them and people could think I'm a member, but the day I started here is extremely important for me to commit to being a member because if I don't do it, why would anybody else want to do it? How will you solicit them becoming a member? And Tracy talked about the mailing that, you know, she felt maybe wasn't as successful as it could be, but that's obviously a learning opportunity for her and the team. But how are you going to bring people in? And starting off is a great way to look at friends and family and the people that are closest to you. And, and that's what we did with both the membership um, groups that I have been a part of. But again, looking down the road, that is really just the beginning and you have to have a plan for what comes next when you've exhausted the people that you know. And so the ongoing uh, training that Tracy's doing with her board and committee, and I know that we are doing with ours, is extremely important to introduce new, new blood and new members to keep that sort of web reaching further out. And then what policies and procedures are you going to put into place? I also have found that that is extremely important. How are you coding people in your database? How are you keeping track of them? When we talk about the um, building this program, you know, I attended a session recently and they were talking about how strategic planning, most people want to look one to three years out. Some people want to look 10 years out, but, but really what they suggested, and this is fascinating to me, is look 50 years out and ask yourself, what needs to be put in place today to make sure that we can really have a successful, I guess it's really the vision of what you want that success to look like. And a lot of that is based on the policies and procedures. Believe me, once you get further into it, it's going to be what about this and what about that? And, and a lot of times we just don't have the capacity to think that far down the line. So policies and procedures are absolutely key, having those answers already for when the donors are asking you. And I just talked about how will you track the giving? And again, if you're going to do multi-year and you're not going to do just annual giving, cumulative giving also becomes a very big challenge if your database or your system doesn't have the capabilities. So keeping it very simple and making sure that you've built it with the really um, foundation of your team and the resources that you have access to, I think are really key. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the WHS Foundation's 1897 Society, which hopefully some of you have heard of. Uh, so it was created June 1st of 2012. We just had an anniversary, which is exciting. I was not here during that time. I had left in 2011 and, uh, of course, told you I came back in 18. But the team here built really a robust and fabulous group of donors. They had many goals in mind. They really wanted to build that major giving pipeline and wanted to bring um, new people into that group. They wanted to educate and share the information about how to impact the health and wellness of our community and continue to build friends and, of course, to continue sustainability and raising money for um, what was WHS and now is UPMC Washington and UPMC Green. 
They created a committee, which um, like Tracy, probably in the beginning phases, everyone was extremely excited and rearing to go. As that committee has evolved, what we have found is people start to exhaust their contacts. And so that happens to all of us, especially when we're talking about levels of giving that start. Tracy started at 1,000, ours start at 10,000 to be paid over a three-year period of time. So that's like a $3,300 a year donor if you think about it in that capacity. Um, so we started looking at how can we break the committee down into focused pockets? so that everybody doesn't feel like it's their responsibility to do everything. And so when I came, we created subcommittees that were sort of categories. So everyone is expected to help with prospecting and stewardship and ambassadorship. But if you have a focus on it and you have a little bit of pressure, that's really where you will spend the most amount of your time. So prospecting committee is to be newer committee members who have not exhausted all of their contacts and relationships, or at least the ones that they currently have. The stewardship committee is supposed to be sharing information that we give them. So resources that we're providing for them that they share with current donors. When I got here, one of the things that I had noticed is that early on, and Tracy, you're probably very heavily in this focus, we want new members and we're trying to grow the program. Well, after you've been doing that for eight or 10 years, you start to realize did we steward the current donors that we have? Did we keep them engaged? Did we share enough information with them to want them to continue to come to our events and really feel like a part of what we're doing? So we started to put more of a one-on-one -on -one touch and focus on that. And then what I started to realize was we'd get new members every year, but I wasn't doing a great job at trying to, those new people who maybe didn't know but one or two other donors that were in the society, I wasn't doing a great job at trying to contact them and encourage them to come to the events and make them feel warm, which is what I would want if I was a new member. And so we have one or two committee members who their focus is supposed to be in that role of, hey, Sarah, you're a new member. I know you may not know people when you come to the event. Sit with me. Uh, you know, basically making them feel warm and inviting and encourage them to be a part of what we're doing so that they can learn more about the organization. So that inevitably they're going to feel better about making ongoing contributions to us. Tracy talked uh, about their levels. We certainly have levels here in the foundation. I told you that we start at $10,000. And so again, that sounds very scary, but it's something that can be paid over a three-year period of time. All of our membership levels and contributions can be paid over that period of time if the donor so chooses. So that's the basic membership level. And then they go up from there up to 100,000. So Tracy, yours are very cleverly uh, named, which I think is really cool. Um, ours are basically gemstones and I'm not 100% sure why that was chosen, but that's what it is. So it's member, uh, sapphire, ruby, emerald, and diamond. And there's a celebration, which I'll show you a little bit of where they're recognized at an event. So we call it the annual event uh, recognition dinner. And if you're a new member, it's super exciting because you haven't been invited before and you receive a pin and a certificate and get called up. So it's kind of a special moment for new members. I talked a little bit about benefits. Are there benefits? Um, and again, that might be a post on Facebook. That might be a newsletter that um, feature. We're starting to feature and pull out our donors so that other people can connect with them. Oftentimes, I think that we feature very high level, high capacity donors, and that's fabulous. And they certainly receive, should receive and deserve that recognition. But we're trying to feature people that others would see as average people, right? We want everyone um, within a certain capacity level to feel that they can be a part of what we're doing. And so we make sure that we feature many different diverse groups of people within the membership society so that other people can sort of think to themselves, oh, well, Sarah and Billy can do it. I probably can do it too. Wonder how they did it. So we're very sort of strategic about that marketing piece and then recognition. So I will 
be full disclosure, I think recognition is one of the most difficult things. And um, Tracy and I talked a little bit about that before this, because she certainly has a challenge there without having a high traffic, visible location where people are in and out of. And so we do have a high traffic area and we do have plaques in the main lobby of the hospital. But honestly, recognition is such a big task. So prior to making a commitment to that, also something to think about, you know, can you keep that going in three years, five years? How expensive is it to purchase those plaques or that unit that you're about to invest in? And how important is it to your donors that they even be on a wall? That's probably something that's the bigger question to ask the committee and the people who are supporting you and getting feedback from them. What is meaningful to you? Maybe it's just the listing in the newsletter. Maybe it's a shout out on Facebook. Maybe it's something at the event so that the 200 people that you invited there get, you know, to clap for these people who are really supporting the mission of your organization. So I wouldn't necessarily jump when you hear recognition to placking, but we do have a placking system here at the health system. I'm looking at time, Joanne, just to make sure I'm good here. Um, so uh, new members, events, marketing, donors, criteria, we sort of talked about all of those so I just wanted to show you, um, just so I didn't have a boring slide for you, show you some photos from our most recent annual events. So one of the benefits, well, two of the benefits are two events that we hold each year. One is an education or behind the scenes tour. We typically do that in the spring and we bring people in to have a different experience of the health system somewhere in the health system that typically we wouldn't bring the general public. So this is to be special. It's invitation only. And um, so if you look, there's a picture of me at the top. I don't know why I chose that one. It's not very flattering of me, but um, at the very top speaking at the podium. So that's our most recent event with the School of Nursing and our simulation center. So we got to really be hands on down in that education and learning center. Brooke is in the center. He also attends all of our events. So extremely important to have the leadership of your organization, if that's not you, which in a lot of cases, I'm sure it is going to be you. Maybe it's your board chair, but making sure that everyone is bought in and, and tries to attend because I think it's really important. And then we also have program staff that speak to the specifics, right? Like we always know enough to be dangerous, but the people who have the heart and the passion for what we do are the people that are on the front lines of each one of our organizations. If you look at the top right, that is one of our annual recognition events that was held um, actually at Ed Morassic's home, which many of you I'm sure uh, know Ed very well. And he is gracious and has a fabulous property and is very willing to share that with others, which we're grateful for. But that's the event where we welcome new members and then members who have increased in levels. And we just find that these events are one of the most cherished things that happen throughout the year with this group. The other thing I'll say about the events is there's times where we've been disappointed internally about how many people attend the events. And we have to remember that the people that are coming are the ones who really are engaged. And sometimes people just have a conflict. And so it's not necessarily for us to take personal the number of people that are attending each event, but we're touching people every time. And then those people are going and sharing that information with others. So we're trying not to get hung up on whether we have 100 people or 35 people who are attending the event, but we're putting in the effort and providing opportunity to each one of them to learn more, and then also to strengthen their network within that society. And so some key takeaways and lessons. Um, build your program with growth and scalability. You heard me say that multiple times because we're in the thick of really looking at systemic change and rejuvenation and regenerizing some of what we started and where Tracy was, which is a very exciting period of time include key donors and uh, committee members and volunteers, and then continually ask for feedback, which we do all the time. Keep uh, focused, Obtain new, obtaining new donors, as I said, is fabulous, but if you don't keep the ones that you have and keep them engaged, it's gonna be tough to continue that pipeline of sustainability. Keep it simple, 
you sort of heard me say that as well. Make sure you can handle on the back end, operationally, internally, everything that you're about to put out, because I definitely have been through the process of this all sounded fabulous whenever we sold it to ourselves. But now how are we actually going to implement from the inside perspective, the piece the donor never will see, but that we will either run super smooth or we will be very frustrated with. And then um, relationships are absolutely key. They're, they're key in everything that we do in development work and in philanthropy and really can't stress that enough. And then finally, sort of next steps. So if you're looking to start a uh, giving club or a society or whatever uh, name you so choose to give it, or if you're like us, and you are many years into this great society and you're looking to rejuvenate it, it's always good to determine the why. Why are you forming this membership group? Not just because it's cool and it looked like it might work, but really why are we doing this and what outcome are we looking to gain from it? Find your volunteers, talk with other fundraisers. And Tracy, you mentioned this as well. When I was at Mon Valley and you know was um, just starting a development program there, I reached out to anybody who would speak with me. I got on websites. I looked at what are the levels that they're giving. And now we're doing that here as well. We're constantly looking for people, whether they're in different states, we're making connections and calling them and saying, why did you do it this way? Do you think this would work? Huh, that's a great idea. Never thought about that. And we're just constantly refining what we're doing. And then build your infrastructure, which I'm definitely will say, aside from relationship building, is our number one key is infrastructure and how that sustainability in the office and back function is going to work. Make sure you share your idea with those you're talking with to start planting the seeds for the gifts. So anytime that you have the opportunity to further talk with people about what it is that you're doing, you're sort of planting the seeds for thinking about they may or may not want to be a donor. So just something to keep in mind all the time. And then the last thing is have fun. Some days our work is extremely fun and we get to use that uh, piece of the fundraising word fun, which is in, in fundraising. And we do have a lot of it here in the foundation. But as we know, it's a very difficult job that we have and our organizations are greatly counting on us. And so thank you all for the work that you're doing in our communities to make it stronger when we work together and support one another. Uh, it only benefits can come from that and positivity. And um, I'm always here for questions. We have an awesome team here in the foundation and any one of them would be willing and happy to share uh, our experience or suggestions or talk through something with you. And you certainly can gain that information from Joanne and the folks at the Community Foundation. So thank you so much for attending and um, we'll take any questions, I guess. <laughs> thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate your presentation as well. And um, it just brought to mind a, a couple questions as well. And I think you touched on this about, you know, you and Tracy have been working on this project for a long time and you have your perspective of it. But have you and how, how were you reaching out to others who were not necessarily part of the organization, not necessarily so close as you two are? Tracy, you want to go? Or you, you. So you're talking about different nonprofits? Different people, different potential donors. Did you reach out to different people who were not so closely affiliated with your association? So I will go first because the, the reason I went first in this presentation is, so I'm like two years into this where Sarah is over 20 years. We're actually haven't done that step yet. Joanne, we have done our board members, our friends, and people on our list. We're not to the the next the next step yet. So, thank you. So I can answer that in a myriad of ways. Number one, your board members and your current donors are obviously key. And we don't necessarily want to feel like insurance salesmen. I love insurance salesmen, several very dear to me. Um, but I mean that in a very like we, we really need to be authentic about what we're doing because we want people 
to not feel like they're being sold. And right. So the best insurance people are the ones that sort of possess that authenticity and those who are selling you, but they don't really think of it that way. And so um, the, the best is when we have board members who introduce us to other folks or have had an experience with our organization. And so for us, I know people think, oh, well, you have all these patients that you can go to. And, you know, it really doesn't, it's not that easy. And so we do have grateful patients for sure. And that is how we have received some, some wonderful donors over the years. But think about the people who use your services in general, because those are the ones who are most invested in what you're doing. If you give tours, look at the people who go to the tours and start asking them questions and engaging with them. And that's really what we do. We start conversations with people and share what we do. And we ask the board members and our committee members to do the same thing. And so it's more of that sharing the message everywhere you go. And it's one of the things that we're working strongly on right now, actually, Joanne, is reframing the way that we are presenting the need to our community so that anytime any one of us goes to a function, whether it's a WCCF function or a chamber function, we're very much armed when someone says, hey, how's it going? What do you have going on in the foundation? And that sometimes is enough to start the conversation. And then following up with those people saying, hey, it was great to meet you at the chamber function. Just wanted to share some more information with you and some of the great works that we have going on. So it's always planting those seeds with the people that you know, and then having them planting them with the people you don't know. And Tracy, you mentioned that a little bit as well in your presentation. I think those are both great answers. So, and that's true. You don't, you plan something, you're not sure exactly what, when it's going to bloom, but it may take a while. Yeah, it, it yeah. definitely has, Joanne. We've had some <laughs> scenarios where years after we've thought yes, something was done true. was not true. and the donor came, came through. So. And I think both of you brought up interesting points about Tracy and you were talking about the challenges to raise general operating funds. And I think then you're, you're um, giving societies regarding that. But then, Sarah, you talked about specific items that the society can function. And uh, how has those, how have you evolved to those different, uh, to those different points? So for us, we certainly do a lot of fundraising that is greatest need. And so that would be unrestricted funding. But when we look at programs or projects or equipment, those are very strategic. So we're looking at, hey, we have this MAMO unit. I hate to use that example because it's $450,000, but hey, we have this MAMO unit and we are all hands on deck and we are challenging the 1897 Society to help us to offset the cost. These are the reasons why you should do it. So sort of like the timeline that Tracy was talking about, I sort of like to call it urgency. So of course, we say to people all the time, hey, you can give anytime you want, right? January through December, you can get your tax write off. But honestly, if we're not giving them any kind of urgency or a timeline or something to shoot to, we kind of find that people become lackadaisical. So when we create that urgency, it creates the need for people to make a decision by a certain period of time. And sometimes that's why we've used programs, equipments, something specific to get them to buy into, we need you to take action now. So greatest need is fabulous. And obviously that's what we all prefer because it gives us some flexibility on what the greatest need may be or the priority in our organization on any given moment. And we have that, but it doesn't provide as much urgency, I think, as some of the other pieces, like an event. An event's great because it's gonna end and people are gonna have to make a decision. And that's why they're successful in some ways. We're trying to create that for all of the other giving that we are involved with. Sarah, you're absolutely right. Think about it. I would never know how much a piece of equipment at the hospital costs. And people who come to the Whiskey Rebellion Education Visitor Center have no idea that we're paying monthly rent. And for people to know, I mean, you hate to share or overshare or, you know, some people don't care, but... People are interested in knowing the specifics of the business. They're interested in knowing, I start every conversation with, 
you know, about the fact that we don't get uh, government grants. You know, we're, since we're a National Historic Landmark, people just assume that we're getting money from, you know, the government. And we were getting a small stipend up till 2009. We have not got any money since then. And just making people knowledgeable of, you know, our needs, specifics. Yeah, I, I love the fact that you named an equipment. Me, I'm like rent um, and, you know, other expenses. So um, we're a much smaller organization, but bringing people to the museum or to the visitor center and showing them what we have is important. They have to understand what we do, what we have and where we're lacking. So it's all about, it goes back to those relationships and talking to people. Well, thank you, thank you both. So by the way, any of the participants can either put something in the chat or raise your hand if you have a specific question. Um, and the other thing is, is that what can you uh, talk about would be the benefits? How had you resolved that? And, and then I guess that you have both uh, opened up your societies to being not so restricted then if you want general operating funds or if you wanted to target some uh, particular equipment need or some special need. Uh, so those are, did you develop any type of guidelines regarding that? That you, I think Tracy, you talked about board approval. Yes, yeah, so, so you started um, that um, topic, Joanne, when you said about benefits. You know, I look at the fact that uh, a simple explanation of the benefit we're seeing from the society is we have a board of 16. We have certain board members who would give their $25, which is the minimum for WCCF, who would give their $25 a year in order to say that they gave to the organization. But we upped the game, so to say, because our lowest level, which is much lower than Sarah's, but our lowest level at a thousand means you have to give 200. So now we have increased income just from the board. So instead of, you know, I, I'm going to use Tony. We don't have Tony on the board. So instead of Tony giving $25 this year, he's giving $200 this year. So the largest benefit we've seen is the increased funds. So I would say there's uh, many benefits, obviously fundraising, right? So you're out, you're, you're, you're getting these folks, um, we call them the closest, right? So aside from our board members and any other volunteers, they're really the closest donors to us typically because they're hearing from us all the time. They're with us physically. Um, but the other thing I really think is that it's expanded our network so much even if someone doesn't become an 1897 society member, we've been introduced to so many additional people in the community. And hey, do we think everybody's going to be an 1897 member? Heck no. But every relationship that we create, no matter the size of the donation, is another donor, which is additional dollars, which is more um, recognition for the foundation, but more importantly, for UPMC Washington and UPMC Green, who are the people who we're benefiting, right? It's our community. We're, we're educating people on the value of investing in the health and wellness of our own care. You know, so it, it's really given us the opportunity to share and people to learn more about their community health system and what that looks like and how they can be a part of it. The other piece of it that I didn't mention that I think is really important is all the events that I was talking with you about, we've started, um, I don't know, we started about five years ago and I was doing this at Mon Valley, but we've started in the last year doing it uh, pretty seriously, is asking the committee members to bring a guest to the events. So someone that they think, um, you know, you have to have many things to be a part of any organization. You have to have the interest in health and wellness, if you're going to give to the WHS Foundation. Um, but you also have to be philanthropic. You have to be giving. You have to have the capacity to give at whatever level it is that the person's looking at. And um, you have to want to come. And so we encourage our committee members and even 1897 members as a whole, hey, if you know somebody 
by all means, bring them with you. Let them be introduced to the other people that are a part of this group. And if it's a fit for them, fabulous. If it's not, hey, maybe it's not the right time. That's okay. Or, hey, maybe they'll be an attendee at our event because they think we're pretty cool um, and, and we have a, a great mission here. So that, I think, has been another key part of prospecting. Well, thank you. Thank you both for the answer. And uh, Tracy, as you saw in the chat, there was a question about why did state of federal funding end? Mm -hmm. And I think that's always a question. Sometimes you are successful in writing a grant and then some other times not so much. I didn't know if you wanted to further address that or both of you want to address that. Um, so to to be clear, so I do apply for state and federal grants and I and I do get them. But up until 2009, we were getting money to pay for the utilities for the Bradford House. I started in 2011. I have no idea why they stopped giving us those payments. I'm sure it had something to do with, you know, government funding and the the or the lack of government funding. So um I don't have an exact answer for Natalie, but I do apply for grants and I do get some grants, but the um, the promised repetitive money is not there. Uh, Tracy, so I also think you had mentioned that to me whenever we were planning for this presentation, and I do think it's important because I sort of assumed that as well. I mean, I didn't think it was running your organization, but I did think that there were some earmarks perhaps that you all were receiving. So, you know, we talk a lot about what do you share and how much do you share? And I know that's sort of a, a touchy situation, um, but probably with with key people, it's an extremely important thing for them to know because then they know you're not just getting those funds automatically. And that's, that's another reason that for your need. So we have another question about what are some tips you have for organizations to educate and cultivate relationships with professional tax, legal, and financial advisors? Well, funny you should ask that, Mr. Pizar. <laughs> right? <laughs> no. Um, Joe, that's a, that's a great question. And honestly, it's where our focus is right now. So for us, major giving, planned giving, consecutive giving, those are all algorithms for folks that may have the um, interest in planned giving. And so we're in the process right now of literally, I'm going to we're resurrecting that as well. The foundation always had a planned giving program, and we certainly have been the beneficiary of many very generous community members who have passed to um, create a legacy for them and their families. But it's really, to me, grassroots. It's reaching out. It's making connections. It's, hey, I know you don't know me. I see you in the community can we have coffee? And that is literally what our team is doing right now. People we do know, people we don't know, and we're trying to hit on all the specialties that Joe put into the chat. So tax, legal, financials, um, we're doing so much more to try to educate people in our publications about um, RMDs, um, highly appreciated stock. We're trying to get stories from donors who have done it so that, again, you can kind of see, hey, I'm an average person. I have stock. That might be a great um, that might be a great opportunity for me to make a contribution and. Um, especially, you know, depending on when the how the market's doing, right? So it, it's definitely a one-on-one -on -one for us right now situation and something we're developing. Mm -hmm. So Joe, you're very familiar with the Bradford House also. Um, as you know, we do not have any planned giving um, or the specialty to even advise on it. Uh, I will say that we did just last month update our website. So when you used to go on the Bradford House website, you could do donate and you literally would donate to the Bradford House or you would donate to WCCF. Um, we use the advice of um, others and we in, we changed that website. So now there are, we do talk about planned giving. We do talk about in all that stuff. And with, with the caveat, please, talk to your tax advisor or your financial advisor because none of us are capable of answering it. I would be so afraid somebody would ask me a question and I would say it wrong, but we're hoping to get to that level that we do have planned giving and, and other, um, the most that the Bradford House is fortunate to see is the, um, the qualified distributions. We do have about five different people who will give us through qualified distributions 
um, and I know that and that I have to send them a certain receipt letter. But um, like I said, it we did just add it to our website, hoping to get some questions and you know, and we'll point them to tax advisors or uh, financial people like yourself. I, I actually think that's key. And this is the second conversation that I've been in in two weeks, actually, or just last week, uh, last Wednesday about planned giving and how we're all worried about like, do we have the right, do we know the right information? We're not attorneys. We're not plan giving experts. We are not estate planners. We don't have all of the answers. And I think that creates, at least I know it has for me in the past, this sense of like, I better not bring it up because I don't think I can answer the questions. And oh my gosh, what if I, what if I don't say the right thing? And all the feedback that I've received and what I would say for anyone who has that same type of reservation is we just need to have the resources. We don't have to be the experts. We have to know enough to be dangerous and to say to the donor, I know you're a longtime donor of the organization, and it sounds like you may want to create a legacy here for the future. There are avenues that can do that that are much different than you just giving us you know, cash contributions as you have been. And it would be great if you could speak with an expert and here's 10 of them that are, you know, that we've used before or hey, speak with your own. So Tracy, I'm with you. you know, there's been many times in my career where I've had that anxiety of, oh my gosh, what if we talk about plan giving? And now I'm like, oh my gosh, we are talking about plan giving. Right? I have totally changed my, I have drank the Kool-Aid, Joe. So <laughs> it is um, It is here and now. So that's my, my sort of pep talk for anybody who's nervous. Well, thanks so much for all this information. Thanks again to Sarah and Tracy for speaking on this important fundraising co concept and that we can talk with one another to learn from each other and to say what's working, what's not working so well. And so just appreciate all your time and your energy for this subject matter. The next session in this series will be held on Tuesday, August 6th, which is creating and utilizing spreadsheets by WCCF manager, Emmeline Ferguson. A link for registering will be sent out in the next several weeks. For the Law School for Nonprofits series, a partnership with the WCCF, the next session is Tuesday, June 25th, with you don't need to form a new nonprofit with attorney Stacy Papa. That registration is open on the WCCF.net website under the Nonprofit Leadership and Engagement category. Thanks to all of you who participated in this session today, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank Thanks you again. all. Thank you, Joanne. Thank, Thank you. you very much.